I'm up here so much, I feel like you're kind of getting bored with David in Nicaragua. It's like, if you just stay down there, we wouldn't have to hear so much of this. <laughs> but I love it down there, and, uh, and there's a reason for it. It's a great place. Uh, I found myself in talking about Nicaragua and Granada Church particularly, that's when I speak of that, that's what I'm referring to, I kept saying central. <laughs> and when I'm back here, I talk about Granada as I'm looking at you. So I'm seeing the two so far overlapping, especially in my heart. So I like being there. But uh, for those that haven't figured out where it's at, uh, it's not Grenada. Uh, I was talking to one person, uh, that's a country, it's Granada, the city, that's in the country of Nicaragua. So right up there at the top, the little green or goldish whatever arrow is pointing to one of those Central American countries, if you can see it there, Nicaragua. And there's a small city off to the side of that larger lake. It's one of the largest or the largest in Central America. And that little town is called Granada. Uh, so there was two things going on basically at the same time. There was a preacher seminar which is my major reason for going. And there was a construction campaign that was overlapping on both ends of that. So we got down there uh, Friday night very late, uh, stayed at a hotel across the street from the airport, and then traveled to Granada, G-R-A-N-A-D-A, -A, that little city. And Saturday morning, they started right in on the construction and worship uh, there in the city. And then after that on Mondays when the seminar started, and that's part of when my work began, and I actually started Saturday. So I was involved in the construction on both Saturdays that overlapped on either side, which was really nice. Um, now, if I can figure out how to do this little machine, it's not complicated. So the construction to start with on Saturday was done. It was, it was not a building uh, as far as a church building goes, but it was behind a church building in a place that was called Nandimi. And so this is the crew. Basically, after they started working for a little while, uh, somebody said, we've got to get the sign out and get our um, little picture here. So this is the construction crew, and there's a, a couple guys on the far left uh, that are locals, and uh, the guy stooping down over here is, is Eddie. Uh, Eddie's a preacher in Nandimi, and the guy standing up behind him is one of the workers there. The rest of us are all gringos or North Americans or whatever, and uh, they've been enough work at already. Some of them hide behind the sign or dirty. If you'll notice, right there, if I can hold my steady hand on that, there's one of those flat iron things that is not a real person standing there. You notice there's no body underneath the face. Uh, there's a fellow that has gone there for every one of those construction campaigns that the, they'd missed so much that they took a picture of him so they could stick flat iron Russell in every one of the pictures and have him there, and they're sending it back to him. So Russell was in another city living here, but he was, in heart, was in part of that group. So the construction, basically, for those that haven't seen this before, you start out with a, a foundation. When you get there, there's something basically already started, so you can begin the, the construction part on top of it. And then these large blocks are stacked on top of it. I think they weigh around 90, 95 pounds. They're carved out of volcanic rock or volcanoes uh, to start with, and they're stacked on in, but they're very heavy. Uh, and so you have to you see the guy on the left in the orange shirt. He's carrying one of those things, and he's marching from the front to the back because they drop them off in the front street, and you're bringing them to the back side where the building is. And then my picture just went out on me. Did I do something? I must have. Um, and then their buckets of cement are brought. So there's just a, a parade all day long of bringing blocks, cement, and these volcanic things to get to the, from the front side where they're dropped off by the truck to the back behind the building. And that's quite an effort, considering there's about eight steps to go up before you get to the level part to do that. And so a lot of manpower involved in moving cement and blocks and bricks, etc. At the end of the day, if you put too many blocks to the back, you have to take them and put them back inside the church building because somehow during the night, even though they're heavy, they seem to can drift away to the neighborhood. So everything has to be locked back up on the inside of the building. So it's quite an effort going and coming. This is what you look like after one day if you're working in the construction. Uh, and this is a cleaner day, actually. This, I think, was probably taken on Saturday. And you could tell who carried more and who didn't. Uh, and I wasn't even in the picture because my part wasn't carrying those blocks. I was warned by several people, not just my wife, do not pick up anything heavy because uh, I've had some back issues.
so they weren't worried about me working as much as coming back and being bent over. That was one of the works that I was involved in more than anything else. This is Paul Bomberg, one of the elders from the East Ridge congregation. Uh, but steel reinforced structure was an important part of when you did the, the, the uh, construction around the areas and framing off uh, that were stacked, I guess you'd say, around the blocks or bringing the blocks up and filling in the gaps. So eventually it starts looking like this after you get several rows of the blocks, then you build the steel reinforcement up and then you start pouring all the cement into these sections here. So you, you get a framework done. Now it's, it's not at all like anything you'd see in America, uh, but it is uh, to some degree uh, earthquake proof. Now it won't, a, a direct earthquake, it won't survive that. But if there's ground that's shaking back and forth, the, the blocks and the cement and everything's set up so they can move and kind of slide just a bit over one another. And this is a government requirement, and of course we want to not only follow their laws, but make it safe at the same time. So there's the complete group of everybody that was involved in everything. Uh, so there are 22 preachers that were there, Nicaraguan preachers, a couple of church leaders along with it that came with a couple of the preachers uh, that found their way into the process. Two translators, one of those uh, on the far, far right, Jacob, whoops, went back the wrong way, wanted to hit a button here. There we go. Jacob over on the far right. Um, Jacobo is his real name, but past few years, don't call him Jacobo anymore. If you go down there, call him Jacob because he's so Englishified that he's in that. So he's translating in Juan. And then the teachers that were involved in teaching the class and the construction crew. So it's a good assemblage of different people. The uh, preacher seminar was Monday through Friday, uh, basically from 8 to 4. There were five different guys involved in the teaching. Majority of the work was done by the four guys on the left. Jacob happened to be translating that day on the far right, and, and Alan coordinating and spoke at different times during the event, too. Alan Womack, who's also one of the elders from East Ridge. So uh, from left to right, I'll dare to step out and try to remember names and locations. Uh, Doug Couch on the far left from White Bluff, Tennessee, Kentucky. Bit of confusion. Great teacher, great instructor. Myself and then uh, Jerry Corbin from Saudi congregation, uh, degree in biology, et cetera, more a pharmacist, and et cetera. And then David Payton, a uh, preacher from Lafayette, Tennessee, and, and then Jacob. So day in and day out, we taught classes Monday through Friday from 8 in the morning until uh, 4 o'clock at night or in the afternoon. And so this was the room where everybody was located and we'd come in about 7.30 in the morning and start getting set up for activities after we'd had our breakfast, et cetera. And uh, each time, of course, we'd have a translator. Uh, I do speak Spanish. I also speak Pig Latin, if anybody's interested, be impressed. Um, but besides that, um, the guys that were there did not, and they wanted to have what I was saying in English. So we, I did English and listened to the translator make sure that I agreed with what he was saying, what I was saying, and everybody else. So we kind of checked one another, being two or three translators in the midst. But there's Doug and myself speaking. Verification. I actually stood there and spoke. So, all right. On Saturday, in addition to the construction campaign, some of the preachers went out and, and had some Bible studies going on. So one of the results was this young man who'd been visiting, whose mother was a member of the church, uh, had two or three studies. He was a motorcycle mechanic along with his older brothers, and a uh, very sincere guy, so we had a baptism while we were there too. So not a bad thing from a preacher's seminar and a construction campaign to somehow come up with a baptism. Really a, a very encouraging event. Um, on Sundays, I was there on one Sunday, um, had opportunity to visit with the Granada Church. They also have midweek services, not on Wednesday. Uh, they, they got their Wednesdays turned around. They meet on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So for three different evenings besides all day Sunday, uh, I went over to visit with the church that we've been sponsoring, overseeing for, what, 15 years, Craig, Chris? Is that right? Somewhere around that? I don't remember exactly how long we've been involved in the work in Granada. But not from infant stages, because there were some Christians there uh, from some other works, but that congregation, uh, because of our efforts, got things going. So. Met with them in the morning, had a men's meeting immediately afterwards, and then I was visiting in the afternoon with different people until uh, the end of the evening. 
each night also, besides all of those activities, we had a devotional with the guys. And so things wrapped up somewhere around 9.15, 9.30. And then uh, in the morning, uh, you got up early if you wanted to and went out and jogged around at, at daybreak and then caught breakfast around 7 o'clock uh, to get your day going. So that was basically what, what it was all about. There's the Granada Church, for those that haven't seen the inside of the building before. Uh, they put the tile in themselves on one of our construction campaigns. That building right there was built. Uh, this is before or right after services. I don't remember which. And so not everybody's sitting in their chair because they're roaming around different parts of the building. But there's a, a good-sized element of people there. Uh, Marcos, one of the church leaders there in the congregation, who some years ago was, was a wayward member, back involved and very much a strong leader within the congregation. Um, some of you who have been down there might recognize this little girl who's not so little anymore. She's taking notes. This is Leonora's little uh, daughter called Beraquel, and uh, student of the Bible, waiting for her brother, who's a little bit older. Is that correct, if I got it right? Uh, to be baptized, because I think she's about ready. But David, happens to be David in Spanish, uh, is still, although he's taller than I am now, uh, say, he's uh, still more like a 12-year-old as far as his social thing, so he's not made that decision yet. Alfredo, church leaders, and one of the things that was really neat uh, in, in being there was to get to worship with the church, but to watch the strength and the growth within the members. Just that one Sunday time, and then the Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday time with the church. And I spoke a couple different times there, but didn't do every one of the lessons because I wanted them to participate. Uh, another person that's newly involved in the congregation is a guy named Nahel. That's like, not angel, N-A-G-E-L. Nigel, maybe, but it's N-A. Uh, Nahel is uh, a convert from about a year ago, uh, or a little less than a year ago, and he's teaching the young people's class, uh, which is an amazing thing. And he's also now going to the preacher's training school on Saturdays in downtown Managua, because he just wants to be a good church leader. He doesn't plan to be a preacher, but he wants to, to learn. And so he, he works Monday through Friday and spends his day Saturday going downtown all thrilled and excited that he gets to participate in that class. And that's phenomenal. So they, he's there from about 9 in the morning till about 4 o'clock in the evening uh, studying along the way. So this is the men's group that I met with uh, that Sunday. There's a couple guys that weren't there for the activity. The guy in the red shirt back in the back row there was a con convert of uh, Richard Arias. For those who remember Richard, that was the first missionary that we supported there. And I'd only met him maybe one time, but not remember that, because it, it was about 15 years ago. And so when he came back, they were introducing me to him, and they told me who he was, and he's involved in the church work now, and doing things, and, and led prayers, and, and did different things. And so it's like excitement about the group. Nelson, who's not in this picture, still involved, and Maximo is there. He's a recent convert, too, on the far left seated there, and, and all the others that have been there for quite a while. Uh, when I see this group, I see strength and growth in leadership, and I, I'm very excited about the fact these guys are carrying the ball themselves, and, and the guy we support uh, works hard. He is a, is a part-time work in a sense. He's not getting full-time pay, but he's up there doing his job, along with all these other guys that are pitching in and involved in the work. So no one's leading the congregation. The entire group of men are leading it. There's no one individual is what I want to say. Not no one. But. And then I want to give you this picture of uh, Danilo, the guy that we support, his sweet little mother. Notice she has his motorcycle helmet on her right hand there. Now, in her left hand, you can't see it real good because it's in the shadows, but that's her motorcycle, her black helmet, rather, in her left hand, she rides the motorcycle side saddle as he brings her to church. He makes about three trips with this motorcycle, bringing his grandkids, his kids, and then his wife, and somewhere along is his mother too. So, no, I'm not going to say, ladies, try that sometime because that's not, but that's, I'm back up just a couple of shots here. The guy on the far right, upper part of, that's Danilo. You can see, you know, he's up there in years. He's not ancient, but, and his mother's riding the motorcycle back and forth with him. 
I didn't catch them as they were heading out because I thought it would be too embarrassing, but it was, it was quite a unique thing watching it all. Put in your prayers what's coming up soon. Because June, we're going back down there. Uh, great opportunity. There are eight people from Central at this point uh, that we have all our money in. So great. And, and we're going to go down there. There's a medical campaign that's taking place. Now, we eight are going to be involved with a group of about 100 people going on this effort. And, and this is connected with what East Ridge does every year, either in Panama or in Nicaragua, taking a medical, ca medical campaign to either establish a church or to help build up a church that's already existing. And they go in with doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, and all the medicine that anybody would ever need is bought down there, packed inside these rooms, and, and thousands, thousands of people show up and, and want medical attention. And they come through and they see a doctor or a nurse, a certified nurse, get prescription free, they, they pass through the pharmacist, they get all these things, they, they're checked for anything they need to be checked for that we can do, no operations or anything like that, they can go to a dentist, they can get eyeglasses, they get all this stuff for free. They can see a doctor down there occasionally free, but he hands them a piece of paper and says, now you go find your medicine yourself. So this is all done, um, courtesy of U.S. Brethren, and this makes an impact in that area like you can't imagine. Uh, a couple years ago, I was out door knocking with some of the brethren in the area, and I talked to one of the guys, and he says, I I'm one of the local firemen. He says, Did, were you the group that came out to our place back about five years ago? I said, yeah, we were. He says, I remember you. He said, one of the things that impressed me is the, the fact of what you did as far as telling the people they were responsible for doing a lot of these things. He said, I'm impressed. He said, you don't give them everything, but you're helping the people. And he said, he had some friends that went by and they picked up beans and rice, which they give out also during that time. And, and so uh, the seeds are being planted in a lot of different ways. And, and so, again, we're back here with the same effort and looking forward to doing in the same location. And everything's being organized for that. So, Dennis, that's where we're headed. So, uh, for those that are headed, Willis's and all. So, it's kind of cool. Um, with all these men who are now, by the way, involved in telling the church they've got to start working today. They're telling the church and talking to the church about what's going to happen in June, saying, find your people now. Start stirring hearts to be ready for this campaign, to come to the activities, to be involved. By the way, the medical part happens during the day, and at night you have gospel meetings each night. So it, it runs. For those that are going on it, you already know because we've talked about it. It starts at about 6.30 in the morning, and it goes to about 9.30 at night. Four very intensive days of this where people are coming through that and then also having a gospel meeting at the end of the day. So pray, if you would. They're already praying. And they tell me quite frequently, please tell the brethren that we appreciate them and covet their prayers. And so if you would, remember when you are praying that God will bless this effort. Um, Melanie, our, because of the kindness of Central and the eldership, are planning to stay down there a month during this June effort. Because after 100 people come in and stir the pot quite a bit and have contacts and people to follow up, we want to be there to help our, our Central brethren down there to continue on. And so we're going to be there for a little while just to give them a good shot in the arm following up on those things. So uh, I'll just leave that part up there. Those that want to cut off, do that whenever. We read a little bit earlier a passage I want to go back to again tonight. It's from Matthew 28. Verses 18 to 20. What do you say to 11 of 12 guys that you chose after training them for three years? How do you explain to them, I'm getting ready to leave? 
and you've got a job. And knowing their failures, their lack of spiritual understanding, would you have concerns over turning everything over into their hands? Knowing they're not even doctrinally aware of what's about to happen as far as the church and the kingdom. They have no grasp about the persecutions they're going to be facing. They don't even understand what church leadership is about other than following in the footsteps of Jesus, which gives you a good image. And yet Jesus comes to them and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All nations. And that was a job. I know I'm popping a lot. Let's just go behind the microphone here. Kind of cut some of that static out. And that was a job that he expects us to continue doing also. And that great commission, which I think it's rightly described, is a commission that's passed down, as well as the authority of Christ is directed toward us, that he has authority over our lives, and over the, not just the execution, but the preaching of the message of Jesus and what it takes to be a Christian. Some of you today, because of having a friend who taught you about Christ, can say, I'm here because, and you can name one or two or three people. Some of you, uh, have parents that taught you. But somebody taught you. What if there was no one there to teach you? Where would you be? Just wandering around in the world? Do you think just by chance that you'd come along someday and maybe at a bus stop you look down and say, huh, Bible, I believe I ought to know that. And you on your own would just sit down and start reading it. In my entire time of working in the ministry, at this moment right now, I can only recall one person that ever came to me with that in mind that said, I've been reading the Bible and I want to be a Christian. Most people come with questions and don't have much of an answer. And I quickly direct them to the Bible. But thank God, and I mean that very sincerely, for a couple people that said, would you like to study the Bible with me? And when I said, sure, I remember this guy going, really? It just shocked him that there are people out there that actually would like to do that. Okay. And so we don't need to forget, not only do we have the authority and we have the command, we have the privilege of sharing the message. We sang a song just earlier in the service. It's what Jesus Christ did for me. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the blind say, I now can see. It's what Jesus Christ did for me. And it all depends on him but we are his instruments. 
We are His voice, His feet, His hands. And it's our job as Christians, whatever job you have in life, the job of Christian trumps that, it, it, that you are a Christian and have that gift of salvation and the privilege of sharing it with somebody else. Let's never be silent. Let's always be bold. Let's always be willing to put at risk, if it be called that, a friendship. As you say, let me tell you about Jesus. Or would you like to, to talk about it? Just any kind of invitation, any way, whatever, that opens the door to let Jesus come in. What if my two friends had decided I was a bit too wild to even be a person that would be interested? Because it seemed like it when you look at where I'd been. I don't think I better attempt this with him. Not only where would I be today, but because of what Christ has done, I've had opportunity to share the message with a lot of people. Teach a lot of people about Jesus. Remind some to come back. And in some way along the way, help influence and encourage. What if? They said, no, I don't believe he really would be interested. Where would people be? And where would you be if somebody had said that? No, I don't believe that's what I should do right now. Don't miss an opportunity. What a privilege to be a part of the kingdom. What a privilege it is for me. I'm so grateful to, to be where I'm at, to get to go places and remind myself of the basics. So I get my soul stirred again and again and again by those visits to the most primitive of places to remind myself what it's really about in communicating the basics. And that's what saves. Are you a Christian tonight? And are you committed? Do you need to stop and reevaluate? And make a change. Maybe privately. Maybe publicly. But Jesus did something for you. And you owe him. If you're not living for him. Tonight's a good time. An excellent time. To be right. We invite you to come while we stay and sing.